Once again, I don't have a PowerPoint today, so I invite you to open up your Bible, do something revolutionary, and we're going to look at that. In fact, I would like everyone here who has access to a Bible to open a Bible and to follow along with me today. We're going to look at Luke chapter 22, Luke chapter 22. As I plow through the gospel according to Luke with lost men and women teaching them the gospel of Christ, I often select key paragraphs that pertain either to conviction of mind, trust of heart, or surrender of the will, commensurate with their needs. But as we get to the end of the gospel account, we tend to read virtually every passage. And I'd like to do that in the next three sermons that I preach here, Luke 22, Luke 23, Luke 24. And I'd like to keep it simple. We often just read vast sections of Scripture, make a a few comments, paragraph to paragraph. And I'd like to do essentially the same thing over these next three sermons. And so even though there won't be a PowerPoint per se, you're getting the essence of what one of these classes would be. And the reason that we emphasize this section at the very end of the gospel account is because the gospel accounts themselves emphasize this period. We're getting into the last words of Jesus prior to his arrest his trial, his death, burial, and resurrection. And so 22 sets the stage for all of that. You have the murder plot unveiled. You have the complicity of Judas Iscariot, a traitor. You have the last intimate words of Jesus to his apostles before these un events unfold and there's an unraveling of everything. Their whole world crumbles as their Savior is taken away from them. He is arrested. Peter denies him. And then the trial commences. It all begins with the first two verses. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew near, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to put him to death, for they feared the people. Why didn't they just come and arrest him? They feared the people. You have Jesus as unpopular as he could possibly be with the Jewish religious leaders and more popular than anybody with the masses. They couldn't just go and arrest him without making a scene and without jeopardizing everything that they stood for. This had to be done in stealth, had to be done undercover, under the cover of darkness, if you will, literally and figuratively. Whenever pure evil intersects with the highest good side by side, there is an eruption that is almost inevitably uh, going to occur. The two are mutually exclusive. They are totally incompatible. And when evil people are in power, they cannot tolerate pure goodness begins to have tremendous influence. They have to deal with it somehow. Don't like 
the message, eliminate the messenger. You turn just a few pages forward to John, Gospel according to John, chapter 3, 19 and 20. John writes, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world. And people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. That's exactly what's going on here. Jesus is a threat. They've done their threat assessment. They have to eliminate him at all costs. Hence the plot to put him to death. But not in open public scrutiny, not with the masses who could erupt against them. They have to do it undercover. Enter Judas into the equation. Verse 3. Then Satan entered into Judas called Iscariot, who was of the number of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he consented and sought an opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of a crowd. Verse 3 is one of the most frightening verses of the Bible. Satan entered into Judas. And this is not a hostile takeover of his faculties, as in demon possession. This is much like the epistle of James, chapter 1, verse 14, that each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desire and enticed. Judas is leaving the door wide open for Satan to enter into his heart. It's interesting here that the spokesman among the apostles in this chapter denies the Lord with his mouth, and the treasurer of the apostles denies the Lord with a bribe. I don't have words for Judas. Traitor is probably as good a word as I can think of. He betrayed his Lord. Verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat it. They said to him, where will you have us prepare it? He said to them, behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters and tell the master of the house. The teacher says to you, where is the guest room? that I may eat the Passover with my disciples. And he will show you a large upper room furnished, prepare it there. And they went and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. It's interesting when you compare these gospel accounts. Matthew's account generalizes this as the disciples who are preparing this Passover feast. Mark's account, is ambiguous, two of the disciples. Luke's account is specific. Peter and John. They do a lot of things together, Peter and John. And in John's account, when the meal commences and they have this long conversation and the betrayal is mentioned, Peter motions to the one right next to Jesus, who is the disciple whom Jesus loved. Who is going to betray him? Think Peter and John. Comrades in so many intimate ways. With privileged access together with James to so many venues. 
And this description, when you've entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you, follow him, speak to the master of the house, so on and so forth, as if arrangements have already been made. And it's cryptic, isn't it? Whenever witnesses are named by name, you have a form of witness identification in these early episodes that make their way into the synoptic accounts. And whenever the main players are not named, once in a while you have witness protection. As you do later on in this chapter, when Peter is not mentioned, Malchus is not mentioned. And uh, here you might have a form of witness protection. But there's another factor. Jesus knows that Judas has already sold him out. And rather than just spill the beans as to where they will be in a private, intimate setting, he tells two of the disciples something very cryptic. And they follow the lead and prepare the Last Supper. So Judas won't know where the rendezvous point is. They gather together to eat the Passover, their last supper together before Jesus will be crucified the next day. And beginning with verse 14, when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes, as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another, which of them it could be who was going to do this. So it's in the midst of a Passover meal that Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. Passover meal being a great memorial feast in memory of an event that precipitated the deliverance of the Israelites from the land of bondage to freedom and their covenant status as the people of God. And in the midst of that meal, Jesus takes two of the elements, the unleavened bread and the cup, the fruit of the vine, And he gives them new significance or a memorial observance for Christians of an event that takes us away from the bondage of sin into our freedom as the true covenant people of God. Verse 24 says, a dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as one who serves. Or who is the greatest, one who reclines at table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table? But I am among you as the one who serves. You are those who have stayed with me in my trials, and I assigned to you, as my Father assigned to me, a kingdom, 
that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. It may have been a a natural outgrowth of denying that I am the one that would betray Jesus. Who's the one who would betray you? Well, not me. Well, certainly not me. Well, no one's more loyal to him than I am. Now, wait a minute. I, I'm, I'm as faithful as anybody here. And then each one ups the ante until they're arguing about who would be the greatest. And Jesus puts all of that to a stop. Yes, you are my apostles. And yes, you will sit on 12 thrones judging the tribes of Israel, so to speak, the people of God, spiritually the church. You've stayed with me in my trials. You're going to have blessings, glory, and honor eventually. But I'm among you as one who serves. And I think it's at this point that Jesus gets down, girds himself with a towel, and washes their feet. Teaches them a valuable lesson. The way up in the kingdom is down. The way to greatness in the kingdom is not to receive, but to give, to serve. The pagans, the kings of the Gentiles, they they know all about lordship. But for you, this is not an authoritarian, ego-driven thing. Kingdom is all about service. And just as I am serving you, you must serve. And then he focuses on Peter. Verse 31. Simon, Simon. Behold, Satan demanded to have you. He might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you. That your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. This is a fascinating paragraph. Jesus pulls back the curtain so that we could get a peek. Just a peek, a glimpse of what Hebrews 7.25 means. That He ever lives to make intercession for us. And here He's interceded for Peter. Satan has demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. And I'm reminded of Job. Satan may look at this as as a game. There are much bigger issues at stake. And Satan wanted Peter. He wanted to rip him up to shreds. And Jesus said, I prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned again, after this pivotal event occurs and you fall flat on your face, when you've turned again, I need you to be in a position to strengthen your brothers. Peter's response is, what in the world are you talking about? I'm willing to pay the ultimate price here. Are you really? The rooster will not crow till you've denied me three times, that you even know me. And I've always wondered about that. That just a few hours later, Peter does what Jesus says he would 
do. As if he had total amnesia about what Jesus had prophesied. But he did fall flat on his face temporarily. And he did rise again with God's grace and mercy to strengthen his brothers. And he would one day pay the ultimate price. Because Jesus prayed for him. And we sing an old song, In the hour of trial, Jesus plead for me. How many times has he done that for all of us? when we needed him to pray for us. Verse 35, he said to them, when I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? They said, nothing. He said to them, but now let the one who has a money bag take it and likewise a knapsack and let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. And what is written about me has its fulfillment. And they said, look, Lord, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. Money bag, knapsack, sandals, pack an extra. No, on the limited commission of Luke chapter 9, the limited commission of Luke chapter 10, those three items are forbidden. God will take care of you. Don't pack heavy. But now, think about packing. But it's not about physical packing. It's not about a heavier suitcase. It's about mentally packing your bag. You went unarmed last time. Now you, you need to arm yourself. You need to brace yourself. You, you're going to have some rough terrain in your travels ahead. And they totally missed the point. He's speaking metaphorically, spiritually, if you will. Lord, here, here are two swords. We don't need to, to sell our cloaks. Go buy some swords. We've got two swords right here. Enough. You're missing the whole point. Verse 39, he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, Remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he arose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Luke does not mention the word Gethsemane. He does not mention that the three disciples of Peter, James, and John have a privileged position closer to Jesus than the other eight, Judas being gone at this point. But he does mention two things the other accounts don't mention. One is that his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. Dr. Luke mentions that. And Dr. Luke also mentions the reason for the sleeping. They were sleeping for sorrow. Their hearts were so heavy with anxiety that they could not keep their eyes open and were drowsy. They were shutting down. 
And Jesus is still frustrating with him. Why? Why are you sleeping? Rise. And pray that you may not enter into temptation. They were totally underestimating what was just around the corner. Verse 47, while he was still speaking, there came a crowd. And the man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And when those who were around him saw what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. I'll pause and simply say this is a form of witness protection. Peter is not mentioned until John's account when Peter is long since uh, dead and gone. Malchus is also not mentioned by name here. He is mentioned by name in the gospel according to John. Jesus said, no more of this. He touched his ear, healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and officers of the temple and the elders who had come to out against him, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. You could have done this in the light of day. You didn't. He's pointing out the obvious in some ways, particularly after the first couple of verses in the chapter, they needed to do this by stealth. Verse 54, and then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat down in the light and looking closely at him, said, this man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, woman, I I do not know him. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you are also one of uh, them. But Peter said, man, I am not. After an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are talking about. Immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And then we have one element Luke mentions that none of the other accounts mention, verse 61. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And if looks could kill. Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Verse 63. Now the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him as they beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, prophesy, who is it that struck you? And they said many other things against him, blaspheming him. And so his suffering begins. Indignities, pain of people striking him with a fist, blindfolded. He could have put a stop to it just like that but he was already beginning to suffer for you and for me. And then later on would come the nails and scourging. Verse 66, when day came, the assembly of the elders of the people gathered together, both chief priests and scribes. And they led him away to their council. And they said, if you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, if I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. 
So they all said, are you the son of God then? And he said to them, you say that I am. Then they said, what further testimony do we need? We have heard it from ourselves, from his own lips. He speaks when a good defense lawyer would tell him to be silent. He is silent when a good defense lawyer would tell him to speak up. He tells them the absolute truth, but he says it in such a way that is calculated to get himself crucified. He knows what they are going to do with this. And yet he proceeds anyway. No one takes his life from him. He gives his life. That's chapter 22 of Luke. 23 next time. Which will be a couple of weeks away since I have a gospel meeting next week. This is powerful stuff, and uh, I would urge you to just sit down with someone else and read it. Make a few of these kinds of comments and just point out, you know, if Jesus were just a good man and nothing more, why all of this? Why all the trouble surrounding him, and why was he ever in a position to be crucified. Obviously, he's more than just a good man. Or he's not a good man at all. Criminal who deserved what he got. But when you look at all the evidence of what he says and what he does and what he claims, and his advance notice in Old Testament prophecy and all these eyewitnesses, when you look at the composite case, you're going to have to come to terms with what it all means. And uh, advance notice, none of it makes any sense. None of it makes any sense unless he is exactly who he claimed to be. And unless he offers you exactly what he came to accomplish, a death on a cross for your sins to redeem you, to come to God through him, and to have eternal life with him forevermore. And all you need to do is put your faith and trust in him and cross that line of total surrender in obedience, confessing him before others, being baptized for the forgiveness of every sin you've ever committed. And he makes that possible. You don't get to heaven on your own merit, but his. We could encourage you to come to terms with this Savior. We're going to sing a song of encouragement right now urge you to reflect on the words that we all sing to each other. Let's do that right now.